Welcome to MD Insights. I'm Matt Walsh of the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. Today we have a, a great guest, Dr. Bijan Existat, who is a transplant surgeon in the Department of General Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. Welcome, Bijan. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. Glad to be here. So you're a liver transplant surgeon, correct? Correct. How did you get interested in that field? Well, it goes back a long time ago. It was 35 years ago. <clears throat> I started uh, when the liver transplant was growing in the United States. And I was back home in Iran, and we had a lot of patients with, uh, uh, I saw a lot of patients with hepatitis and cirrhosis. And uh, <clears throat> so decided that uh, maybe I should do a fellowship uh, in transplant. And in 1991, I, uh, Dr. Starzel accepted me to move to Pittsburgh, and uh, I started my fellowship uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and uh, I did my fellowship in adults and pediatric transplant over the following three years. So, uh, so you've gotten to know some pretty eminent uh, people in the field of transplantation. Any reflections on uh, some of the people you've come across throughout your career? Well, the first one was uh, obviously Dr. Starzel, who uh, he has been, he was head of, um, pretty much like a uh, <coughs> godfather of transplantation, especially with liver transplantation, that, uh, and uh, which was an honor to work with him and also my uh, direct boss was uh, Dr. John Fong, who uh, helped me through the course. Okay. And of course, many other transplant surgeons that I worked with, each of them moved out and became heads of uh, transplant programs in the country. So one of the things we wanted to talk about today is immunosuppression and what is new. Um, certainly, if you get a, a liver transplant, you're going to need immunosuppression to avoid rejection. Sort of what, what were the initial um, medications used for uh, immunosuppression when you first got into the field? Well, when I got into the field, uh, it was the beginning of a new experimental drug called FK506, which uh, we used it at the University of Pittsburgh. And that uh, now is famous of uh, tacrolimus that we have it today. And uh, or uh, <clears throat> at that time, uh, also, <clears throat> we used it for uh, uh, transplantation of the liver, kidneys, and uh, uh, pretty much every organ system. And that was a proved to be a lot better drug than the cyclosporine, which was in use uh, before tacrolimus uh, and uh, showed that uh, there is a superiority of the <clears throat> function and also prevention of rejection and uh, increasing graft and patient survival. So that was the beginning of uh, tacrolimus or FK506 that we used in Pittsburgh. And compared to some of the other immunosuppressants, how does, how does that medication work? Well, if you look back uh, at the, the transplantation uh, history, uh, when, when they didn't have anything but uh, in, uh, pretty much like uh, as a tyoprene and steroid, survival of liver transplant was about 20% in one year. In 1980s, early 80s, when uh, they used cyclosporin and steroid survival went up to almost 60, 65% in one year. And tacrolimus uh, uh, pretty much increased survival to almost 80, 85% one year survival after liver transplantation. And the same thing, uh, graft survival in kidney, pancreas, heart and lungs uh, increased uh, during this period with, with the new medication. And, but how does it work to achieve those outcomes? Uh, it was uh, pretty much tacrolimus was unknown pretty much to everyone. Uh, you mean tacrolimus or every, all these medications? Tacrolimus was pretty much unknown. So Dr. Starzel learned about it, brought it to Pittsburgh, 
and we print and had uh, Tetrodimus uh, uh, as we did, did, did use different doses of Tetrodimus in different patients and we learned about what safe drug level is and what is the dosage that we need to use for prevention of rejection and uh, <clears throat> so gradually uh, in, in, in following three years uh, we um, refined the dosage and um, drug levels in, in blood drug levels and also and that was the time that the, uh, the medication was uh, introduced to uh, FDA and FDA approved it as a medic uh, as a drug for transplantation. And and help us with the concept of chimerism. What's chimerism about? Well, chimerism is uh, the uh, state of uh, uh, when uh, the body immune system recognizes well. Rejection, uh, I should start with rejection. Rejection means when body immune system recognizes graft as non-self and tries to destroy it. And that's our immune system, the work of our immune system. Chimerism is when uh, the, uh, those uh, cells, those immune cells from the graft and immune cells from the host, they get to a point that uh, they, they, they uh, <coughs> pretty much get to mix together and uh, they make this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, mixture of cells of donor and recipient that we call it chimerism. Now, if we see this chimerism, uh, we can find it uh, and we see those cells, we call it macrochimerism. If they are hidden in, in between the recipient cell, we call it microchimerism. So we don't see, we, can, we can't find it, but they are pretty much there, but we don't see them, we can't, there is no test to find them other than biopsies and uh, we look for them in different tissues of the recipient. That's a chimerism which as time passes by uh, and body, uh, they get to a state of uh, condition called, uh, they get to know each other and try not to reject each other. Uh, we call it a state of tolerance, which is an ultimate goal of transplantation these days. And are there certain solid organs that that uh, degree of tolerance happens better? Liver versus kidney versus heart is one of type of transplant more susceptible to this tolerance level? Well, solid organs still they have a long way to go. Um, but the good, perfect example of tolerance, if you, will, if you will, probably is the bone marrow transplant. That after some time, they stop immunosuppression and there's an engraftment of bone marrow, and, but from the donor to in the recipient. But, but for, with liver, kidney, and pancreas, it all depends on many factors to get to that state. And uh, there are still many unknowns that who, can achieve tolerance or not, uh, other than uh, just um, systems of trial and error. Uh, about that means that in, in 1992, I remember when we saw pa certain patients of Dr. Starzl who had who were done in uh, Denver in between in 70s and early 80s. Uh, we learned that they had stopped immunosuppression and they never rejected. So Dr. Starzo brought these patients in, checked on all these multiple biopsies from liver, lymph nodes, and different places, and looked at the uh, component of blood. And we learned that there is a, there is a condition called tolerance. My body uh, immune system has become tolerant to the foreign body, which is a graft. Uh, but Markers of tolerance, we have found many markers so to, over the years, but, but still there is lacking. We can't find uh, specifically to do a blood test or do a tissue test and say this patient is tolerant uh, to the graft and we can stop immunosuppression. Are there patients who come off immunosuppression though, currently? What's, what's the chance of that occurring? Well, uh, chances are probably less than 20%, I should say. Uh, and, and those are patients that they are very long-term patients. Uh, definitely not a good idea to start 
decrease weaning immunosuppression or weaning off immunosuppression in patients who are like three, four years out after transplant. In the beginning, we chose patients that they were off, uh, out of, of transplant for about 10, 15 years without any episode of rejection. So we thought that there should be something in this patient that they never rejected the organ and started weaning them very slowly and gradually. And, uh, and some of these patients did show toler tolerance. They never rejected again. And unfortunately, some did show, uh, did proceed with rejection. And so we had to put them back on uh, anti-rejection drugs. Uh, there are Protocol, there are protocols that we used in Pittsburgh uh, that we uh, induce these patients with uh, a, a strong induction therapy, and then we decrease the amount of maintenance immunosuppression. So uh, we let the uh, body, and uh, as, at the same time, we can the body, but we didn't really destroy all the immune system. And at the same time, uh, we did not, uh, the, the immune cells from the donor and immune cells from the recipient, uh, we call it, this, they got to a state that they started kind of expanding and fighting each other to some extent until they uh, exhausted. And that's the state that we can say they, they became tolerant and uh, of each other, and uh, and uh, they didn't need immunosuppression. Uh, but but again, if the, the the problem with that is that if the donor cells become too strong compared to the recipient cell, then we get to a point that uh, they, they start destroying the recipient organs. Rather than the completely reverse part of it, which we call it graft versus host disease, which is a fatal disease. And, uh, but, but, uh, and then if the recipient cells get stronger, they reject the organ. So that state that these two immune systems, they get to a point that they don't reject or destroy each other, that's where the tolerance happens. Right, so the opposite imbalance is graft versus host. And, and how, of, how often does that happen? Uh, it depends on the organs. In bone marrow transplant, almost 30, 40 percent. Uh, and in the liver transplant, about one to two percent. Uh, in intestine transplant, heart transplant is higher. Definitely, intestine transplant can go up to 10, 15 percent. And uh, if it happened, that it would be uh, extremely dangerous and fatal. Right. So, what are the typical uh, side effects of? Uh, the current immunosuppression regimens? Good question. Uh, when we look at the history of immunosuppression, in the beginning, it was only to have prevent rejection and increase graft on patient survival. As patients survived longer, we saw some complications. These complications uh, can be uh, renal dysfunction as a side effect of anti-rejection drugs metabolic disorders, um, <clears throat> cardiovascular disorders, and malignancies. And uh, that's uh, where uh, the complications happen. And, and then uh, these are pretty common with uh, tacrolimus and cyclosporin and other medications that we use for anti as anti-rejection drugs. Okay. And so bearing that in mind that despite the success of the current immunosuppressants, there are still complications. What what are there things new on the horizon potentially for immunosuppression? Unfortunately, not very many medications because uh, transplantation is not what we call is not a favorite for pharmaceutical companies. So most of the effort is now for oncology and other medications. But but at the same time, we use some of the, those uh, biologics which we call them antibodies, and we use them in, uh, as an immunosuppression, but for induction of immunosuppression. And with that, we can use lower doses of anti-rejection drugs as a maintenance. So we, hopefully, we, we are hopeful to prevent those complications. Or we use these antibodies uh, when we see uh, major rejection episodes in um, transplanted patients. So we use those antibodies, which are very strong uh, chemicals that wipe out all the 
white cells and immune system for prevention of rejection. So those are the ones that we use. But again, uh, after huge move uh, in the big in 1990s uh, and, uh, and 2000, uh, that we had many anti-rejection drugs came to the market, then everything stopped. And pretty much we haven't had a real good new anti-rejection drug in the past 10, 15 years. So in terms of the liver, how can you tell when rejection is happening? Uh, we uh, follow our patients carefully with uh, liver function tests. It's uh, the only thing that uh, can, we can, there's no uh, clinical or, or sign that we, patients say, oh, I have this, this problem, I think I'm rejecting. Unless they present with jaundice, uh, which uh, or uh, fever or things like that, they come to the hospital and we find out about rejection. But uh, if they present with jaundice, that's extreme of very bad rejection. Or, but but when we, we we follow our patients very carefully, depending on how far out they are after transplant, and uh, what we do is uh, based on the changes in uh, liver function test, we say we get concerned about possibility of rejection, so we bring them in, we do liver biopsy, which is gold standard of diagnosing a rejection. And any changes in a liver function is not really due to rejection, it could be because of other issues like blood supply to the liver or biliary problem. But for rejection, we have a specific features that only we can see them on biopsy. And what, what is the typical treatment course if a patient is rejecting their liver? What, what is the sequence of uh, treatment? Okay, uh, the, the, it all depends on the severity of rejection that we see. Uh, if it's a very mild rejection early on, we can just manipulate the dosage of medications that the patient is on as a maintenance. If it's more than early, very early rejection, then uh, our First line treatment is uh, large doses of steroid, which is still is the best treatment uh, for the last, has been there for the last 50, 60 years. And if the rejection is more towards uh, moderate or severe, then we uh, also increase the do uh, level, uh, increase the dosage and level of uh, and uh, tetralimus or other maintenance medications. But uh, ultimately, we use antibodies. Uh, if they are towards moderate to severe rejection, then we know that we can't wait to, for a steroid to work. Or then we use antibody to very quickly get rid of all those immune cells. And I know you're a, um, a transplant surgeon who deals with uh, the pediatric population. What do we think are the long-term consequences of uh, immunosuppression in, in children? Well, the same thing, other than uh, renal dysfunction, which probably uh, is our major concern all the time, uh, we can see a uh, problem with gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, but our major fear in children, actually, a lot more than adults, is uh, development of malignancy and uh, development of a lymphatic malignancy, lymphoid malignancy, rather that we call it post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. And this is something that when we suppress the immune system, a uh, certain group of white cells can be get infected with, uh, special, uh, mostly with, uh, as a result of a virus that can happen in children, the uh, Epstein-Barr virus, that makes those Im immune cells uh, immortal and they keep growing. And control of those cells are by another group of cells that we suppress them because of immunos with immunosuppression because they are they, they are responsible for rejection so when we suppress those cells these immortalized cells can grow and uh, make uh, lymphoid uh, tissues which uh, are like lymphoma and we call them uh, post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder for to prevent that we have to adjust immunosuppression, watch children uh, really well. If they develop a problem with the virus, we could try to control the virus or lower the immunosuppression so body can 
the fight the virus better. And if the process moves on to develop uh, uh, PTLD or proli uh, lymphoproliferative disorder, then at that time we have to really lower the immunosuppression to almost to stand still, no, no immunosuppression. At some point we have to do surgical procedures or do chemotherapy. Great. Well, very interesting, Dr. Eisenstadt. Thank you for all your contributions in transplantation, and uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. And I thank everyone for joining us on MD Insights today.